Well, good morning. It's the appointed time for the MAPS 3 Citizens Advisory Board meeting of December the 15th, 2011. We will officially call the meeting to order and uh, move to uh, item two on our agenda is a consideration of the minutes of the October 27th meeting of this board. They, you've been provided copies in your packet. Are there uh, corrections or additions or comments on the, on the minutes? Shall we approve them? It's been moved that we approve the minutes and seconded. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 It is unanimous that the minutes are approved. We, item number three on our agenda is a consideration of the 2012 meeting schedule, uh, which you have had furnished to you in advance and is uh, available for your comment. Eric, you want to uh, review it with us? I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. I think what you'll find is the uh, there's two versions of the calendar. We've got a, a written version and then we've got an actual calendar attached to your packets. You'll find that the meetings will continue to fall on the fourth Thursday of each month, except for the two months, November and December, and due to the holidays, those will be the third Thursday. Are there any questions or comments by members of the, uh, of the board? Are you asking us to approve this schedule for next year, Eric? We are. We do need to file this with the state, so your approval is recommended today, yes. I move that we accept the schedule. Been moved and seconded that we accept the schedule as presented. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. The uh, item four on the agenda for today is to receive the MAPS 3 revenue and expenditure report. Eric, are you going to review that for us? Yes, I'd be happy to. We did not have a meeting in November, and so you do have two reports for your consideration today. You have the September 30 and also the October 31st reports. Um, I'll speak more towards the October 31st report since it's the most current, um, but you'll see that our total revenues to date, which include interest, um, are now in exceeding $136 million. You'll see a summary of the expenses below, so you'll find that uh, there's been a significant amount of progress made on the park, um, which is mostly land acquisition. You'll see the river, uh, which is design services um, that are underway for both the lighting and the windscreen projects. And then you'll see some general program expenses, and those are more for ADG's consulting um, over the past uh, year on the program. I was asked last month um, to incorporate uh, the sales tax target percentages um, on the report. We haven't been able to, to do that just yet, but I do want to go ahead and make that report to you today. Um, through the October time period and the October sales tax collections um, using our city reporting, October was about 1.7 percent over the target. And so again, we continue to receive um, sales taxes that are over our target projections. When we talk about uh, the MAPS program, MAPS 3 tax is a cumulative total since inception. We're about 3 percent over the original target. So things are very good. Great. Michael Adams, you want to give us your... Uh... I move approval. <laughs> All right. Is there a second? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. I, I had one question, even though it doesn't have anything to do with approval. Just to follow up on what you said about the general programming, the, the consultants that are hired for each specific project, those charges are charged to that specific project rather than general programming? Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have item five on our agenda is a resolution uh, relating to uh, uh, an agreement about the core shore area and our relationship with the Oklahoma City Urban Renewal. Do you want to explain that to us, Eric? Yes, I would. If you recall, back in October of 2010, we entered into an agreement with, with Okura, Urban Real Authority, to assist in the land acquisition process for the new park um, and other MAPS projects. But it had a, a defined area. Um, the amendment that you have before you expands that area into some additional urban renewal areas um, that will give us an opportunity to utilize them if we so choose. There are two properties that weren't in the original area. That would be the new convention center site and then also the new Santa Fe station, which has been identified as the new hub location. And so this amendment will allow for us to utilize Okira for those purposes of land acquisition um, if that's recommended by the city, but this will set that up to, to make that possible. 
So the only changes are, is you'll find that uh, the central business district has been added um, to, the exist to the original core to shore area, and that's the change. Are there questions for Eric regarding this action? Well, there's included in your packet a resolution approving amendment number two to the MAF-3 implementation and coordination agreement for the core to shore area. Uh, you've had a chance to review it. Would you approve it? I move that we accept the resolution. I'll been, second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt this resolution uh, authorizing the um, amendment number two to the implementation and coordination agreement. Uh, further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimously adopted. Item number six is uh, a resolution that uh, relates to the demolition of the federal post office. Eric, could you explain that to us? You're going to receive the, the recommendations to accept projects once work has been completed. And so the demolition of the post office is now complete. And so you're being asked today to recommend its approval. And this will allow us to close out that contract. The form of the, of the information that you've been provided today identifies that the final inspection was held in late November. You'll see that there were two representatives there that, that attested to that, and you'll see that the final claim amount of $9,980 will make that final claim following your recommendation and council's approval. And so these will be issued for each of the projects as we complete them, and so this will be a, a matter of business that you'll see more of in the coming year. That resolution is also included in your packet. It's a resolution accepting project M3P002 for the demolition of the federal post office. Is there a discussion of that item? Would someone like to move approval of the resolution? I move that we adopt it. It's been moved. Is there a second? Yes. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt this resolution. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? It's adopted. Item number seven. By the way, is this a record pace? We're... You just had to say it, didn't you? You just had to talk about it, didn't you? <laughs> okay. As long as we can keep my eyes from coming up here. All right. We're, we're... Yeah, I don't want to. I shouldn't have jinxed us, should I, Eric? Okay. All right. Item number seven is uh, another resolution. This is authorizing the acquisition of properties uh, as described in the agenda. Uh, would you uh, enlighten us about that, Eric? I would be happy to. If you recall, the Convention Center Subcommittee spent a considerable amount of time selecting the site for the new MAPS-3 Convention Center. Um, the report was issued, um, but at that time we had not received the recommendation to actually acquire the site. So it's been cited and the report's been approved. But in November, the, the subcommittee actually did take their action to recommend that the advisory board consider this item to be forwarded to the city council that staff be authorized to proceed. And so we're, we're prepared at this time to do that. There is a map attached of the convention center area to this item um, that coincides with the report that was issued. We're looking to go and acquire fee simple. We're hoping to not have to enter into the condemnation process on this. And so following your recommendation, we'll forward this to city council and we'll begin that process. Are there questions for Eric regarding this uh, resolution? Well, the resolution is included in your packet to authorize the acquisition of this property as described in the resolution and in the agenda and as described by Eric. Uh, is there a motion to approve that resolution? I move approval of the resolution. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded. We adopt this resolution authorizing this acquisition. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The uh, resolution is adopted. Uh, the next item, uh, item number eight on our agenda, is for the approval of the draft final plans and specifications for the race course lighting improvement included in the MAPS 3 Oklahoma River project. Uh, Eric, would you want to describe that for us? Oh, well, we are, we are proceeding with the completion of the plans for the race course lighting um, that started um, earlier this summer. And so Garver has been actively pursuing that. We've had several subcommittee meetings, and there's been a lot of questions raised in the last couple of months, and these mostly have to do with the scope of what's going to be provided and the budget that's available. And so the budget for the project is $3 million, and we've identified several alternates um, for consideration for the lighting system. And so I want to go ahead and invite uh, Curtis Brown with Garver, 
who's going to make a presentation to us. I think we should reserve a little bit of time to discuss. Um, but as I get ready and, and, and Curtis uh, makes the presentation, um, the River Subcommittee did make a recommendation at their meeting um, that we go ahead and proceed with the draft plans, that they be completed and forwarded to Council as soon as they're complete. And one of the things that you'll find in this presentation is that we are still wanting to expedite this project to make that lighting available as soon as possible. Um, the project has slipped about a month. We'd like to avoid further slippage, and so doing this today will allow the staff to finish the drawings, um, allow the, the engineer to complete those and get those out to bid. Um, but it is going to come with a series of alternate recommendations that I think I'll wait for Curtis to present and, uh, and we can follow at the end. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try to keep you on your record pace here and go through this fairly quickly. Uh, the uh, base bid of this project was a 20-foot candle uh, lighting for 1,000 meters, and uh, the four of the alternates that we were asked to look at that are included in the plans currently are the alternate one, which is a setback of the poles on the north shore, a two, which is actually uh, making all the poles on the course uh, robust so they can handle some uh, future expansion and other systems, uh, an alternate three, which is increasing uh, the lighting near the finish line to 70-foot candles, and an alternate four, about... Uh, uh, from the 200 meter mark to the 500 meter mark being 40 foot candles and I want to go through those in a little bit more detail here uh, here but that was a quick overview uh, yes sir okay uh, the base bid uh, includes uh, oversized uh, conduit and spares uh, so future circuits and other things can be pulled so there's no new trenching or anything we just will not have actually wire in all of those conduits under the base bid Again, 20-foot candle, it's a standard weight pole, which is a size for the 20-foot candles. It uh, doesn't have the structural capacity for expanding that system. Uh, it's a square array of lights, not an architectural array, uh, and, and the, all the electrical equipment is just sized for the 20-foot candle, as a brief over overview. Also has some lighting under a buyer's bridge and some warm-up warm and run-out areas for, for safety, all under the base bid. Uh, I'd like to uh, call attention, it does not include any uh, courtesy receptacles. Uh, any, uh, we had a remote antenna tower to house antenna for uh, other systems in the future that is not included. And it does not include any uh, uh, additional lighting beyond 20-foot candles at either the start or the finish. Uh, so that was the base bid for 1,000 meters. And again, a, a quick overview, that base bid was about $3.1 million. We also, as part of base bid, uh, as part of extending OG&E infrastructure to the uh, Riverfront District for this project and also to support other developments in this area, uh, about $580,000 is what OG&E was going to uh, ask uh, this project and city to pay uh, to extend their infrastructure to support this, this project, bringing the total base bid to just shy of $3.7 million. And we are aware it's a little bit over budget, and that led to some of the alternates I want to talk about at the end of my presentation. Alternate one was heavy-duty poles. Uh, main thing is uh, basically doubling the size of the foundation, structural integrity of the poles. Uh, 19, there's 21 poles total on the project. Two of the poles had already been set back and beefed up as part of base bid near the finish line tower. Uh, this alternate uh, beefs up the other 19 poles on, on the project. And uh, for a cost of just shy of a million dollars, about $987,000, bringing the total price to $4.68 million. Alternate two is a setback of the pole. Uh, this price is assuming that alternate one had already been uh, taken. If uh, alternate one had not been taken, this price would increase some because as you set the poles back, it goes to a taller pole with more fixtures, and we do have to beef it up to the uh, robust pole and foundation. Uh, but this uh, 30000 price uh, is to set back all the North Shore pr uh, poles, again, based on the assumption that alternate one had already been taken. Uh, fairly minor cost increase there. Set back at six poles. And uh, those poles are indicated here on the slide in, with the yellow centers for your reference. The alternate three uh, goes for 70-foot candles, basically from the finish line to the 200-meter mark. That costs about $253,000, and that includes, if I can get a little help advancing a slide, please. Uh, uh, the uh, in includes uh, just adding additional fixtures 
to electrical circuits uh, because we'll have a high and a low setting at the 70-foot uh, uh, candle and all the electrical uh, uh, equipment at the service points will be beefed up to uh, handle the 70-foot uh, candles uh, system. The last alternate would be 40-foot uh, candles from the 200-meter to the 500-meter mark. Uh, what this would, uh, would do also is pull two circuits, so you'd have a high and a low circuit during, for this area as well. Uh, the electrical equipment would be uh, also beefed up to handle not only the 40-foot candle system, but maybe a potential 70 in the future um, for all, at all the service points. But uh, only enough fixtures should be hung for a 40-foot candle system. Um, if you would please, sir. And uh, last here, I'd like to talk very briefly about the uh, schedule, and then I want to get into some uh, recommended uh, revisions to this alternates that the subcommittee presented. Uh, the schedule right now, we're uh, here in the middle of December, uh, assuming a, a very quick uh, notice to uh, finalize the plans as, as presented and, and recommended, recommended today. Uh, we can get plans done uh, late January, early February, and out in bidding and, uh, in mid-February, uh, bids opening in March, and a very quick turnaround to get uh, the materials uh, ordered, fabricated, uh, and start the infrastructure starting in April. We have about a three-month delay in getting the, uh, the poles uh, for fabrications, uh, so that really is a critical path as the fabricating of the poles and the lights and then their installation. Uh, following that critical path, we're looking like late October, uh, November for installation of uh, the 1,000 meters of, of lighting. And uh, that's a fairly aggressive uh, construction schedule, uh, but we feel it's, feel it's doable in order to try to make some late, late summer events. Uh, the subcommittee uh, and some of the discussion, uh, as you saw through the presentation, we're, we're significantly over budget accepting all of these alternates uh, that are uh, certainly enhanced performance. Uh, so the subcommittee asked us to look at uh, doing a, uh, uh, I guess, a reduced distance of, uh, of lighting. And so we, we kind of broke these down following the same alternates, looking at a base bid of 500 meters and then robust poles up to 500 meters and everything, just kind of focusing on a uh, finish line to 500 meter mark. And uh, this information will be made uh, available a little bit later, but I have a spreadsheet kind of showing. But a, uh, a base bid of from zero to, f or finish line to 500 meters, we have a base bid of uh, $2.1 million compared to the 3.1 if we went to the full 1,000 meters. Uh, you also have the same $580,000 surcharge uh, for uh, uh, OG&E, but it's uh, really about a million dollars cheaper. That fall, falls well within uh, your $3 million base bid budget. Uh, an alternate one, which actually makes the, all the uh, zero to 500 meter poles robust, uh, a heavy duty pole, heavy duty foundation, and since it was such a minor cost to go ahead and set those back once you went ahead and beefed up the infrastructure, we included that in this alternate. And that uh, adds uh, just shy of $580,000, $577,000 uh, to do that. The alternate uh, uh, two we had in there was uh, in the event that the base bid of the full 1,000 meters, we had a second alternate that would make uh, the poles robust from 500 meters to 1,000 meters. Uh, so you have a choice of awarding either base bid and focusing on robust for the first 500, a second alternate for the robust for the second 500. Alternates three and four of 70-foot uh, candles from zero to 200 or 40-foot candles from 200 to 500 are unchanged uh, from uh, your presentation up above. If all the alternates were accepted uh, for the uh, uh, re reduced scope of the 500 meters, we're looking at a total project of three point, including the OG&E surcharge, of uh, $3.8 million compared to a $5.2 million to do a 1,000 meter course. And uh, Eric, uh, yeah, you care so, to let, so let me explain a little bit of where we're at is that, uh, so the presentation and what we've been working against this entire time is a 1,000 meter race course, you know, one that had a consistent lighting level from start to finish line. I mean, in the subcommittee meeting this week, there was discussion that most of the races are actually less than 1,000 meters. So there's opportunities to light it, say, from five or 600 meters to the finish line. And there was a desire from the subcommittee to go ahead and provide all of the alternates or all the upgrades that were within the budget 
within that shorter race course distance. So instead of trying to get to 1,000 meters, the subcommittee was recommending that we go as far as the dollars can take us and do the full upgrades for whatever that distance might be. Maybe it's five or 600 meters. What we've asked Garber to do is to set up our bid alternates to give, it that, give us that flexibility. Give us that flexibility to honor the subcommittee's recommendation to you, which is what Curtis just described. Uh, but also give us the flexibility that if something were to change over the next month, as the plans were being finalized, um, and as we forward our recommendations to council, making sure that there's flexibility that when the bids are received, that if something were to change between now or then, we could either go back to a 4,000 meter course or make those decisions once the bids are received to do a shorter course with more upgrades. And so I believe that, uh, that Garber's done this, that, uh, that we're going to revise the list of base bids and the alternates, and that will be the more significant change from what the plans look like today at, up to the point where we'll take those to the city council. But in both cases, either option could be addressed. We can either do 1,000 meters consistently or we could do a shorter race course with more upgrades. And uh, it'll just be decided when the bids are received as to how we'd like to proceed. Do you have any comments from the uh, subcommittee? I do, I do. It was very important to us that this be done right. We don't want to have to come back later on and try to redo things and not let us progress the way we wanted to. So we decided and we were just absolutely, number one, stunned by the OG&E $580,000. That was kind of a real setback for us. But we decided with Mike Knapp's um, advice that since most races are shorter, that we could shorten it and still have all the first class amenities that we want this to have. So that was basically why we made an amendment and changed our suggestion. And let me comment somewhat on the OG&E. There was a lot of coordination effort that, uh, that was early on in the process and there were some early indications um, that was gonna be a cost that maybe OG&E could absorb. And uh, through those communications, they're not sure how to provide for um, funding this because they're not sure how often the race course is going to be used. If there was a guarantee that could be made that said that the lights were turned on so many hours a month, they could program that into their budget. They could program that into their cost model and be able to tell themselves what the payback term would be. But that's unavailable to them now. We don't know what the consistency of use or how often or how many watts and things that there are. And so we've got an option before us now where we would actually pay that up front. We'd pay for the electrical service to be made to the site as a one-time cost. And so that's what's being proposed today. There would be a separate agreement that we would go to between the city and OG&E to make that happen. Um, it would be cost that would be borne by MAPS-3, but outside of the contractor actually installing the lights, there would be an independent agreement um, to take care of the electrical service. But the costs are being included in this report to you today because it'll be the total cost of the project when it's complete. So the alternative for us to think about is that uh, you're saying that we would be paying for the electricity ad infinitum. I mean, however long there were races, if it lasted a thousand years, this would pay all the electricity bill forever. No, this just takes care of the infrastructure to get it to the lights and then there would just be a standard billing. So we would just receive electricity at whatever the rate is this is just to get the transformers and the extension of service to the shoreline of the river to power up these high intensity poles. But they would normally build that into the fee structure. But, if, but, it, right. If they knew what the, what the usage was. But they don't have that information today. There's just no history on this project. My understanding, Tom, is that they, I mean, normally they would put this in, they would pay for this and they would add it to the utility bill and collect it over a 10-year period or something. 10-year period, okay. Or, or amortize it out over some period. You know. Sure. And so it's not normally an upfront cost you would have to bear. In that regard, Eric, if it would normally be part of the normal electric bill, is it proper as MAP funding or would it have been something that would otherwise have been paid through, I guess, general obligations or something of the city? And so are we shifting some money that you know, to maps that would have otherwise have been paid as part of maintenance or electric utility bills? I don't believe so. I mean, the service is required for these lights. And so without these lights, we wouldn't require this. But going forward, who picks up the electric bill? You know, I believe that's something that we'll be working out with the Boathouse Foundation and the River Trust. They are currently operating the river, mm -hmm. um, the river activities and the river events under their own. Um, and so this would be something that would be transferred to them. This would be a new cost um, to the events that are on the river. So is there a way for us to recover 
that cost from whoever it would would otherwise have been paying it under the OG and E normal scenario. I think I think maybe there's some confusion. I mean, without these lights, we wouldn't put this cost in in place. This wouldn't be something that the city would do in anticipation of anything else. This is truly the cost to just get the power to the lights, and so it's being attributed to the project. But normally, OG and E would would not have had this upfront charge. They yep. would have added it to the utility bill, and it would have been paid by so for, somebody other than MAPS. For a new service on, say, a, a school or another commercial building where they're able to use some typical rates, they are able to do that. Um, this lighting system is unique. It's a one of a kind. And so they're just not able to, to, to forecast that. It's, the data is just simply not available. Yeah, I understand that. It just seems like we're shifting cost um, from where it would otherwise have been. Okay. And I don't believe that's happening. And it's just a cost to OG&E that's being, being proposed to the city that if we want that service, this is the cost to get it there. But the information we've been furnished is that the construction cost budget was $3 million. And we hadn't anticipated this $580,000 charge. And so we're adding this to the construction cost. Is that? Yes. Am I understanding that correctly? And the alternative is that, um, uh, A, we wouldn't get it, I guess, if we didn't, if we didn't pay for it, or we reached some agreement to them. Could, could we do it like you do the parking here? For example, if you lose your ticket, and you have no way of knowing how long you were there, they have a charge that they charge you. Is that a way to think about this? That they could, they could give us an estimate and then we could balance it as they do in virtually every business. If you, I mean, that's, that's the way they do in oil and gas production, virtually everything. They, they make a, an estimated charge and then they balance it periodically. If we did that, they could incorporate it into the cost and we wouldn't be facing this unexpected problem. Is that a possibility? And, and let, me, let me reverse just a little bit. So og &E actually came to the city with four different options. So this wasn't the only option. There are some other options, but there are options that, uh, that the city guarantees a minimum use or a minimum billing per month. Sure. Um, and so would we be receptive to paying a bill for lights that never were turned on, per se? Um, but uh, there's hybrids of that approach all the way through. So we either pay the cost and pay a, a normal utility bill for usage, or we, we agree to have some minimum charges that guarantee the repayment to OG&E for their cost. And mm -hmm. so I, I say that, that the agreement with OG&E is not complete. We have not negotiated this fully. Um, but there's going to be an agreement of some form that's going to need to be presented to the city council as a part of the project. Allow us to get that agreement completed. Um, our goal is to, to have that considered by council at the same time. But we'll look into this option. I think we'll look into all available options and we'll, we'll select one that's in the best interest of the city to move this project forward. I think we'll also, um, you know, to follow up on Tom's comment about the 580000 you know, each of the projects does have contingency that was built in as a part of the implementation plan. Sure. And so we knew there would be unknowns on these projects. And so, yes, there will be river contingency funds or river project funds, either through phase four or through contingency, they're going to possibly be affected. But we will use the money within the river um, budget um, to complete these projects and at a point where we are making decisions in the future about program contingencies or recommendations to council we can address those as they may arise in the future. Dee, I guess uh, the, the proposal that Curtis has made to us is, uh, is the one that your committee is recommending that we approve today? Before we go on any further, I'd like to make a couple of comments. I think it's absolutely essential that we go ahead with the, the beefed up polls offset further because for future growth. But the question about OG&E offset, does that also include anything that would be done uh, to accommodate the Whitewater Park? Because I, I noticed in that presentation that OG&E util, OG, OG utilities run through that or will run close to that. So will this offset cover any adjustments made for the Whitewater Park, or will that be an, an extra offset that will come against the park, the Whitewater Park? And, and then... I'm not sure we can answer that fully today. This is going to make it easier for them to provide future services to the district, but I don't believe it completely covers all potential future development along the corridor. So more specifically, I mean, it's going to provide them some limited capability to have limited expansion. So when the lighting, if it is upgraded to higher lighting levels, there won't be new services required for the higher intensity lights if they're added to these poles later. 
Um, but there's a lot of river development that's underway that's going to require additional services, and that's not necessarily included in this. I mean, there's going to be sure. future upgrades that are going to be required as it develops. Okay. The, the final question is, will the offset of the pole setback interfere with the, the Whitewater Park second option that you were looked at? Is it, that's in your presentation? And, and, and let me address the Whitewater. I mean, there's some additional questions that have arisen on the agenda item that is next on today, um, and we're not going to want you to take action on that to allow ADG to do some further research, but that would be one of the items we want to look further into to make sure there is no interference. Well, are, um, are the setbacks, Eric and Curtis, I, I guess I thought the setbacks were going to be in the area where the boathouses were, they are. the finish line, rather than somewhere else where the white water is. They are, but I believe the last two poles are in one of the option areas considered for the Whitewater Park. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. Other Rusty. question, did the subcommittee consider the OG&E different options? Do you know? When you mentioned, Eric, the uh, guaranteed minimum billings might be an option. I'm just curious if that's been considered by the subcommittee. Uh, we were never given an option. We were told it would be a fee and that would be added. So, okay. so I think it's interesting. Surprise. The options, I'd rather, you know, if you guys fully considered them, then I'd be more willing to accept a good recommendation from that group. There, there's obviously some cost-benefit analysis that needs to be done to look at all the city's options, to look at all the riverfronts options as they are handed a system, and so we just need to fully vet those, and, and that's not complete today. So that's why I don't have an agreement to, to share, sure. um, but we will go through that and make sure that we make a, a selection on the option that's in, the again, the best interest of the city. I do want to... I've got the actual recommendation that was made by, by the subcommittee, and it is slightly different than what, what Curtis has presented, but let me go ahead and read this. But the, the goal is this, is that what, uh, what Garber has presented is the capability to fully, fully complete the subcommittee's recommendation or something that could potentially be different after bids are received if we choose to go in a, in a different way. But they, they actually recommended that, they, that the consultant continue drafting the plans with the base bid consisting of lighting for the first 600 meters versus 500, um, using heavy-duty poles, setbacks, and 40-foot candles. And that's what they would like to see as the base bid. And for alternate number one, it would increase for the first 200 meters of the course up to 70-foot candles. And for alternate two, completing the course from 600 to 1,000 at 20-foot candles. But again, as we structure the alternates for the final plans, that would be one option that we could select to make that very similar proposal. But if something were to change again in the next month and a half when bids are received, we would have other options available to us as may be needed. But this will go back to the subcommittee for the review and recommendation back to the advisory board once bids are received. Okay. D? Uh, yes, I would like to just tell you all that the reason the foot candles, it's really important, is for television. We are getting national attention, it's high definition, and that those are the requirements. Really important to have that so we can make our way, yeah. Thank Good. You. All right, is there further discussion? So what exactly is the resolution to today? <laughs> the resolution today is to, to seek the advisory board's recommendation in forwarding the, the draft final plans and specifications to the city council once they've been completed and to advertise for bids. We're looking at 3.8 million. Is that the number we're, we're, we're thinking we're at? Well, that is the estimate of cost today, but until the bids are received, right. we, aren't, we don't really know. Then when those bids are received, it will go back to the subcommittee, and they will review it, and then they'll bring it back to us, and then on to the council in the normal course of yes. When well, are you going to forward this straight to council? The, the final plans will go straight to council to be issued for bids, but once bids are received, we'll come back through the subcommittee okay. to seek their recommendation on the award of contract. Okay. So it'll be back to this board as, as well. All right. So we'll have another opportunity after the bids are received to review the alternatives. All right. Is there further discussion or further questions? Do you want to make a motion about this? Uh, I move that we... I move... Sorry. I move that we recommend to City Council to um, accept or look at our plans to increase the uh, draft final plan and specification of MAPS 3 Oklahoma River course lighting project M3R002. Is there a second? second. Further discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
we've adopted the resolution. I've got a quick question, and I didn't want to muddy the water until until that was passed, so we didn't get into this whole thing. But I'm really curious what it would add. Do you have any idea what the cost is to add 110 circuits to those poles? I mean, I know that's not in the base bid, but I can't imagine a Vents won't want electricity as you go down through the course. Is it a huge money item? Uh, no, no, sir. It's roughly $10,000 per location. Uh, $10,000 per location for us to do that. What it requires is a, uh, what we call a mini power zone mounted on the pole that converts the 480 to 110 and then pulling down. So every pole would be $10,000 to add it. For, it? It could, if it's every pole, it would be a quarter million dollars, or if it's two or three locations, $30,000. But that's, is that something that could be added later? Uh, to the yes, poles? If, if, if we spec, yes, it can be added very easily later, and the conduits we have in have the spare capacity to pull that extra circuit. All right. Are there further questions of Curtis or Eric? Well, thank you. Well, uh, I guess we're going to hear more from you as we talk about the Whitewater, uh, which is item number nine. You want to give, introduce thank that you. subject for us, Eric? Yeah, let me introduce. And I think that uh, there's not a lot of consideration on this item today. We did also at the River Subcommittee this week, um, ADG made a presentation, Mike Mize, um, on a site study. Um, if you recall, about a month ago, um, there was a recommendation made to look at the Regatta Park site for the Whitewater facility. There were some questions about... Uh, feasibility, you know, is it possible, look at all the conditions, utilities, uh, flood zones. Included in your packet today is that presentation that, uh, that Mike made, um, but there were some additional questions that were raised this week, and so I would ask that you allow staff to take an additional month um, and have ADG look at a few of the questions. Um, there were some, some cost to utilities, there were some flood zone questions that were raised, and a few other items that we just need to further research before we make the recommendation today. Did, one of the things they were considering was whether or not there was uh, enough space for to fit the white water. Did there? I, I, I was gone and didn't get to read this. Did did their report indicate that it will it would fit into the into the projected site? So there's there's not a fit issue. It does fit. It and, fits. Uh, okay. And there's actually three options for fit, and it's just based on size of facility. And so. Um, you'll you'll find if you wanted to re review the information, there is a slide that shows three different site options. Um, the uh, only option one is unaffected by utilities, and option two and three would require utility relocation. So that's one consideration, and it comes at a cost. Um, but there's some other considerations um, regarding some elevations and how we would actually structure um, new soil and getting, getting the flow of the water correct and some things that just really need to be answered before we consider the item. So this is not an action item for us today. This is a report item. We would ask that you actually uh, defer this till next month, and we'll bring this back to you in January. Tom, right. we, we really, due to time, did not get a chance, Mike did not get a chance to present the report. He stood up and told us it would fit, basically what Eric said, but we did okay. not have a chance to get, go through the report. So, Great. So you all will be looking at that at your meeting in more next detail, month. I assume in more detail later. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about that? All right. Item 10, the Consultant Review Committee reports. We have several reports for your consideration today, and I, I think what I may do is just cover each of these. These were interviews that were completed in the last month. The first two items that you have is 10A and 10B, and these relate to the um, trail improvements, um, Project M3T001. Um, if you recall, we'd advertised um, the trails um, for consulting. Um, we have a length of trail that we believe would be best served by engaging two consultants rather than one. It'll allow us to expedite the work on that first trail system. Um, the top two consultants, and you'll find the consulting report attached, our triad design group, that is item 10A. You'll find the next highest consultant as, as following that uh, subcommittee report is Garver. Um, and so we're asking for your consideration today to allow us to proceed with negotiating contracts with each firm, uh, which we'll bring back. The only question that is uh, remaining is where we would divide that trail system, and we're working to make sure that it's of, of an equal amount to the west and to the east. This, is, again, is the Overholzer um, River Connection Trail um, that was advertised, and there's three additional trail projects that will follow after these are selected. So with that, I can answer any questions that you might have. This is in regard to the trails project. We do have a third one that's on the sidewalks. I'll go ahead and address that. This is uh, the first phase of the sidewalk. You'll find that there were independent interviews held on that project as well, and the recommended consultant is Smith Roberts Balschweiler. Um, 
and uh, they will have a two-part scope of work. One is to do master planning services, the second being the initial design of the sidewalks. We've received a lot of input um, from the city's planning department. We've received a lot of input from the subcommittee. Um, and all of that information will be provided to the consultant to assemble and to start making recommendations so that we can proceed with construction in areas across Oklahoma City. Right. Does that require action on our part, or these are? We'd like for you to receive the, co the consultant review reports um, and recommend the resolutions on each authorizing a negotiation of a contract and, uh, and forwarding this to the city council. I, I so move that we accept the reports and uh, recommend approval in, with negotiations with all three of the projects. Do you need to do them individually, or can we do it in, in a group? Like you can do them all together. We can do them together. Okay, so moved. Right. Is there a second? Awesome. Further discussion? Further questions? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion and the resolution is adopted. Uh, that brings us to uh, item 11. Uh, the general topic of discussion or action on the MAPS 3 program, is there anyone that has an item to be considered under that item? If not, then let's move to the subcommittee reports. We've heard uh, some of the actions of the subcommittees that met this month. Are there any subcommittee members uh, that have matters to be brought before the committee? Wayne? Well, the, the Senior Health and Wellness Center uh, we didn't we didn't meet subcommittee did not meet this month, but uh, we are in the process of selecting a consultant, and we're also in the process of reviewing some proposals for operating partners. And uh, hopefully, it's still on track for by the end of the year, but we may miss it. Okay. Uh, the convention center subcommittee did not meet this month as well, so no report for us to give. Uh, Susan, did you want to add anything about trails and sidewalks other than the, the action we've just taken? Yes, um, we did meet, and um, we're kind of excited about our next meeting. We are looking at um, one of the committee members has a great relationship with people at Chesapeake, and they're helping us um, create a plan for sidewalks. So we're looking again at doing some kind of a um, survey that will go out to the citizens to get input. Um, we had, and it, the Neighborhood Alliance did do a survey already once, but um, after talking to Chesapeake and working with part of their, is it G, GIS group, Eric? Um, they're very willing to partner with us and maybe help us improve um, the look at the survey and also then map out for us. So we had one giant map that we looked at. It was very interesting and gave us some initial ideas. And then Randy from the city has um, been working with them too. So we know we're not going to be able to uh, pave everything we'd like to, but one product we hope to come out of this subcommittee is a, a nice start on a master plan for sidewalks for the city. Great. Okay. Kimberly, do you have anything you wanted to say about the park? Uh, the park committee did not meet this month. However, we did meet in November, and um, that meeting was very much focused on uh, addressing all of the ideas, thoughts, and uh, feelings that all the committee members and, and certainly people throughout the city as well have uh, input so far on possibilities for development of both the upper and lower park. Uh, uh, Wayne Corville and the MAPS 3 staff worked very hard on compiling that all together even to the 11th hour so that we could review all that and we are now ready to begin the process of an RFP for consultant and uh, move in that direction. So we're, we're on good course. How are you doing on the Skydance Bridge? Well, as a matter of fact, Friday, uh, the mayor had a, uh, uh, a, a ceremony, if you will, as we began installation of the pieces of the Skydance Bridge. So for those of you that may not have been able to attend that event or haven't driven by, um, there is an amazing new site in Oklahoma City that uh, 
I think you all need to take a look at. It's exciting to um, even go down in that area. I know many of our subcommittee members have gone down there in some small little groups looking, and it's amazing how as you start walking around the areas, you start to feel like you're in a park. And certainly the Skydance Bridge uh, is going to be an, an amazing connectivity point and, and something else that helps set the Oklahoma standard. So we're excited about that. Eric made a presentation earlier this morning to another uh, committee. You want to add anything to that, Eric? You know, I think I just I, uh, second Kim's comments. I mean, obviously, as you as you look with the absence of the post office building now, which was finally accepted today, I mean, there is this new view to the south south of Oklahoma City, and um, you've got, of course, Union Train Station and the Skydance Bridge and the new interstate, and it's just something that we've not been able to easily see because of some of the other buildings in the area. But I would invite you to take a look at that. It is. It's, it's very tall, it's about 200 feet tall, and uh, the second wing or the final main structure was, was put in place just uh, the day before yesterday. There's a lot of detail work that's going to continue over the next several months, but uh, uh, final completion on the project is, is about April. The interstate, though, will open much sooner than that. You probably read in the paper they're targeting January now, so, but I think as we get ready to start using those eastbound and westbound legs of the new Interstate 40, you will drive actually underneath the Skydance Bridge, so it's definitely an Oklahoma City icon. Great. One further point, you had mentioned Union Station. As areas begin to clear down there and, and we do have a, a better visual of what's going on, um, our subcommittee is really anxious about trying to find some alternate uses for things like Union Station so that those iconic representations of Oklahoma can further live on as we develop these great parks. Okay. Zane, did you want to, was there anything about modern transit that you wanted to? Uh, we did comment? not have a meeting this week, and I really have nothing more to report. Okay. D, anything to add from the river? I, there was a big announcement made this week about canoe and kayaking moving their national headquarters here. That was uh, that discussed at your committee? Continues to go on. Great. Every, every new announcement, we're getting closer. Great. great. Rusty, anything about the fairgrounds? Uh, we did not meet this last month, so nothing new to report. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else from any of the subcommittees? If not, let's go to item 13, the informational items that uh, that Eric's going to review for us. These are each end of, these are each informational. There's no action required on on these. What you'll find are three. Um, different items that have to do with land acquisition in the upper park area. You'll find the first item um, is the uh, commissioner's award on parcels V10 and V11. Um, this item was, was taken to the city council on number of the first, and, and so there is no action required that, but we wanted to include that so that you could see progress. The second item is a parcel V11. This is to uh, add relocation benefits for old timers glass and mirror. Recall as a part of our relocation policy, we are providing for certain expenses, and so this was an item also taken to the City Council on November the 15th. And then the last item is the purchase agreement for parcel V16, um, again, as a part of the park. We've included um, in the last, the updated park map, it's also been placed on your screen in front of you. So you'll see the amount of blue continues to increase um, ever so quickly as the acquisitions um, of the upper park, or I wouldn't say coming to a completion, but significantly complete. You'll see the last of the tan areas is in the upper right-hand side. Um, those are some of the final negotiations that we hope to make uh, in the next month or two. That also includes one of the ramps to the existing I-40. And so that's one of the reasons that that was, you know, that's a parcel that's not going to be able to be acquired until after the new interstate is moved. But considerable progress, and I can answer any questions on the informational items. Any questions for Eric? So DOT only owns the land under the ramp itself. They don't own any, any of the rest of that of three or, three, three or four. So it's bisected. There's property to the left, to the west, and to the east, to the right of that ramp that's privately owned. All right. Any other questions for Eric? All right. Eric, you have anything else you want to add? I think the, the subcommittee reports were, were very on, and I, I think I'll just add a couple of items. Obviously, with the action today to, to move forward on the acquisition of the convention center site, that will go to the city council next week, and staff will pursue that immediately. 
on the downtown park. Um, as we've just seen, the acquisition of the upper park continues. Um, but we're getting ready to advertise two new projects for the park. Now that we've got significant acquisitions underway, there's now utility um, and some additional demolition. And then we also have environmental coordination that needs to, to begin. And this is going to help vacate those streets and remove the overhead power poles and all those things that we've talked about for the past several months. We'll hire some consultants to go ahead and get those plans ready to go ahead and work forward as we start to prepare the, the new pallet for the park. Um, we're also prepared to go ahead, and if you'll follow the implementation plan timeline, you'll see that it's now time to engage the master planning consultant for the park. And so that will soon be advertised, and we'll go through the same selection process that you've seen on the other projects to engage our park consultant. And so I, I do see a lot of activity on the park in the coming months. We look at the modern streetcar. Um, we are also now at the point in the timeline to engage a consultant for, for that project. And so this would be somebody, again, to assist the city through the review of several items. We've got a lot of data still to collect. Um, but as I continue to update, there's a lot of activity um, that's still underway with the alternatives analysis. The, what we've heard as the environmental or the NEPA environmental process has actually been started, and so that's also underway. And these are things that are ongoing with the city. Now, they relate to the modern streetcar, um, because obviously a lot of the decisions that have been made regarding the route are going to be coming back. But we're now at that point with our streetcar project that we're ready to hire MAPS-3 consultant to take us forward. And so that will be advertised very soon. The river improvements, of course, the race course lighting. We will be prepared to bring the windscreen study update to you, hopefully in the next month. Um, but we're actually getting ready to advertise yet another project on the river, and this would be the starting system um, and some of the race course improvements. Um, and then, of course, we'll bring back the regatta site um, evaluation from ADG. Um, Fairgrounds has got a series of interviews scheduled to that first project for the, for the parking and the site in preparation for the new um, exposition center. Um, are being scheduled on senior health and wellness. Um, we've received those updates. There are the RFPs for partners that have been received and under review. We also have the architects and engineer or architectural proposals that have been received for that first wellness center. And so those proposals are being reviewed. Interviews are to follow. On trails um, and Harry, sidewalks. Before, before you get off senior wellness, and Wayne, I wanted to ask you all this. Does the, uh, does the selection of a partner uh, necessitate the selection of a site. In other words, if a partner, if we select a partner, they, they're not necessarily saying they'll do it at any site. Right. It, so we make a decision about the first geographic location when we select the partner. Is that what you all are thinking? It is, and it's one of the criteria that will work into the review and the approval process. I mean, obviously, if there's a partner that has facilities or doesn't have facilities or has a location in mind, we'll work through those questions and very much a part of the process. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. But the goal is to have that partner and the architect available at the same time so that as we work through the design of the first center that it's been located at a site that's agreeable and that the design unfolds in a way that meets the requirements of, of again, the community. Sure. One that that partner wants to operate and one that's agreeable to the city and the advisory board. Um, and then trails and sidewalks, I mean, obviously there's a lot of movement. We are approving today the authorization to negotiate contracts. We'll be bringing those contracts back. Trails and sidewalks were in multiple phases, and uh, we would like to expedite those. So just as soon as those contracts have been negotiated, we're going to go ahead and advertise the next series of trails and sidewalks projects. So we will be doing these simultaneously and uh, trying to push that work out very quickly in 2012. So there's, there's a lot coming in next year. I've, we've uh, finished that planning process this summer. We've engaged a lot of, of consultants this fall, but even more consultants are going to be engaged in the spring. So expect uh, additional meetings in 2012. Well, uh, Amanda. Mr. Chairman, as a matter of process, on item number nine concerning the Whitewater Park, you will need a motion to defer that item to the January or February meeting. Thank you very much. Item nine that we were asked to defer, we'll need a motion. Uh, so let's, let's return to item nine. That has to do with the uh, Regatta Park site for MAPS 3, and the recommendation is that we defer it till next month. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Wayne, I'm sorry, second. My hearing isn't what it used to be, Wayne. Uh, all right, the motion has been made second. Is there further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the matter is deferred. Uh, 
We now come to item 15, comments by board staff, citizens. I, I'll begin with this. Uh, Mike Mice and the ADG team, I don't want to start the, the awful precedent of having a meeting where you all don't get to uh, uh, say whatever's on your mind. Is there anything that you'd want to comment to begin this process? Make sure that's in the minutes. <laughs> Thanks for being a good sport. Uh, all right. Other members of the board have uh, have anything they want to add? Eric or other members of the staff? Thanks, Amanda, for keeping us on track. Uh, this provides the opportunity now for any citizens who are here that have any comments they would like to make or would like to address uh, the board. Are there any citizens who would like to do that? If not, we would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>